I was sort of imagining a, a, a cozy round table discussion of scripture with, you know, 10 people or so, and not, uh, not 38. But, um, but thank you very much for responding. Uh, I think this just is proof that, um, that the Holy Spirit is calling his people to, uh, to read sacred scripture. And it's the word of God. It's the truth of the church. It's, it's the truth that we live by. Um, and so uh, let's just go ahead and begin with a prayer. And I'm, with this one, I'm going to be teaching a little as I go. Well, we're studying the Acts of the Apostles, early, the early Christian church. This is, uh, the Acts of the Apostles records essentially the story of the early church, focusing quite specifically on the ministries of St. Peter and St. Paul. Um, and I'll say a few words about why I chose this or why I think the Lord asked me to choose this, uh, but first, as we should begin all things, uh, let's start by invoking the Lord in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I would like to read from Scripture. This is often how the early Christians began uh, their prayer, uh, but for those of you who have a Bible, I'm going to read a section from Acts 4, uh, starting with verse 23. And I'd like to actually make a prayer card with this prayer because to our knowledge, the prayer that I'm about to recite is the first or certainly one of the first public prayers that we have on record from the early church. So it's a very powerful prayer. When they were released uh, and this is uh, John and Peter, I believe. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who by the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to speak to your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And that is the prayer. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with all boldness. So, Heavenly Father, we gather together in your name, we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ to, to read your word, the word that uh, was inspired by the Holy Spirit, the word that you gave to us through the gospel. We ask you to uh, remove uh, any blocks in our minds, our hearts, our understandings, uh, anything that is not of your will, we ask you to remove that from us now so that we might truly understand uh, your will for us, your truth for us, uh, your love for us. Now, after, and we are still praying, like I said, I'm going to teach and kind of pray at the same time, the, the Christians would gather and they would often read scripture and then they would um, they would voice petitions. They would speak out what was on their minds and on their hearts. And this had several functions in the early Christian church. Of course, they did not have the internet. They did not have newspapers. Where did they get their news? Well, just imagine 
if we're the, an early Christian community, we are a Christian community, just maybe not so early of one, uh, and one of you is a tradesman or one of you is a centurion, you know, you're from across the empire, and all of a sudden you say something like, we would like to pray for the victory of the Roman legions in a battle in Syracuse. And all of a sudden, everybody else goes, there's a battle in Syracuse? Oh, well, we didn't know that. And all of a sudden, we have some new information about not only what's going on in the world, but if we begin to pray for personal things, it, it, it had an interpersonal element as well. How am I going to support you as a brother or a sister if I don't know, for example, that your mother is on her deathbed? Because you pray for it. You're like, well, I did not know that. Maybe I should give her some support. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, I would like to pray in a special way for, uh, for my nieces. Um, I'm a little worried about my nieces. They're not, uh, or at least two of them, are not really going to church anymore, um, which is causing their parents a great deal of grief. Uh, and also for, for my mother and father, who are um, just going through a lot of changes in their life and um, not really feeling so, so well right now. Um, we pray to the Lord. Lord. Are there any intentions that you would like to mention? And gathering together all of these intentions, um, let us pray with the words that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, quick question. I'm, I'm going to begin to circle, circle closer and closer around this topic, and by next class, we're actually going to get into the first chapter, which I, I have some handouts and some things for you, and I'll talk about some housekeeping and, you know, how the class is going to uh, just progress um, towards the end. But just to start introducing the book of Acts itself, uh, but also, you know, maybe why I chose this or why I think, again, I said before, uh, the Lord wanted me to choose this. Uh, this simple question. I mentioned that, uh, and I know that many of you know this, that we have the scriptures because, uh, of course, they were inspired and holy men wrote these documents to be read, generally speaking, in churches. That that was uh, one of the original functions for scripture itself. Now, do you think, so uh, at the time of Acts, in other words, it would be logical that they might read uh, one of the Gospels, right? No? <laughs> Good. Some people are sharp. That's exactly correct. At this time, okay, we're dealing at the time of the church. This is right after Jesus is risen from the dead. Um, as a matter of the first chapter or two, it just precedes Pentecost. So this is the, the, the earliest church, the earliest times, right after Jesus has died and risen. The Gospels, none of the books of the Bible, the New Testament, that is, exist yet. What a, what a fascinating time to study. What a fascinating time. Because they're, they're not basing their faith on, on a book. They're basing their faith on living, breathing, praying, miracle-working apostles and others that have met Jesus Christ personally or who have come to their faith uh, by those who have met him personally. So I mean, what a, what a fascinating time to study. 
And this gospel spread. Like at this time, and I think that there's even one, there's one spot where it's even mentioned, that the church at this time consists of barely over a hundred members. Okay, not including the people who, who maybe heard Jesus preach, because of course several thousand heard him preach. There's different estimates about that. And, and, and might believe in him, but we're not organized as a church. So this the church is the church as, as we know it at this time is just tiny. This tiny, fragile, but apparently highly powerful and highly potent community. Because within a few generations, the faith spread to tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of people throughout the Roman Empire. So what a fascinating time to study. What a wonderful and blessed time to study. Hopefully that, does that make some sense? Yeah. I mean, sometimes, and, and I... I I, don't, I know some of you have studied scripture before, so some of you know some of this background, uh, and, and for some of you, it's completely news to you that the books of the Bible don't exist yet, and won't exist. Most of the books of the Bible were written somewhere, or I mean, I mean Bible meaning New Testament, somewhere between around 65 to 100 or so. Roughly that range, okay. The, the year that we're dealing with, or the years, the Acts of the Apostles ranges from somewhere around 30 AD or so to maybe, maybe 55 or 60, somewhere around there. So just imagine an entire generation, if not two, if not three, uh, you know, passes down the faith without scripture. It just, it is, that's just a fascinating thought. And I guess what I was praying with is, is how could this faith spread in an empire that was generally hostile to what Christianity stood for? And I'll, I'll try to, uh, to share what I mean by that in just a moment. I have on the board, is kind of where I'm going, in the fullness of time, like this is an expression that's used several times in scripture. Um, it's used in Galatians chapter four, verse four. St. Paul mentions, um, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now it's also mentioned in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. It says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. In other words, the fullness of time has come, is what it says in Greek. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So here's this notion that, okay, just a question. Could the Father have chosen any time he wanted to send his son to this world to redeem it? Well, it's not really a trick question. Of course, of course he could. He's the Father. He can do whatever he wants, right? Um, um, there's no argument from us. It's more about us. Interesting. Um, he could have chosen any time that he wanted, but for some reason, he chose this particular time. You know, to, well, of course, zero to 30 or so, the time of Jesus, and, and the generations right after that, generally within the Roman Empire, that there was something about that time that the, the father wanted Jesus to go into that time. He picked it. Now, do we, do we absolutely know why he picked it? We, we can't. It would be arrogant to say that we know the mind of God. 
We have some guesses, though. Scripture scholars, saints, fathers of the church have written about this phrase, the fullness of time. And I want to mention this because this is the time that we're studying. That, you know, this, this early Roman Empire, period. What, what was going on there? Because one thing that I'm fascinated by is, you know, well, what, what was the life of the early Christians like? Um, how did the gospel spread? How were, what, what were they thinking? How did they pray? Okay. Um, I think that these are fascinating questions. So I just want to give you a couple of hints about what that fullness of time might mean. The word in Greek is pleroma. Uh, that's pleroma. Now, Rome had conquered most of the known world by this time. And I said, that's the key word is known world, because of course we know it got a good bit bigger, right? Um, we started finding new sections of it. But you have to understand that it was an unprecedented time in history, that generally speaking, Rome had established a certain level of peace throughout the empire. Uh, that in comparison with previous times, uh, it was fairly safe to travel and to do trade. Not only that, but they had created a system of roads to conduct trade, two main things, to conduct trade, and also to get their legions around to keep the peace. Now, it's called the Pax Romana in, in Latin, but the, the great Roman peace. Okay. What a perfect time to set up the spreading of the gospel in a, in a world that had become a little safer and easier to travel. Right? You see what I mean by this? Um, and again, do we know this for sure? We, we don't. We don't know the mind of God. But we do have some good guesses about this. The, the Roman world was incredibly multicultural. Now, this is something that I think that we need to understand about the demands that the Christians had for conversion. Okay, that what, what was the state, their spiritual state of the Roman Empire? Because, of course, we have, in a way, we have an empire around us as well. Um, some of it's not very friendly to us. A lot of it is actually quite hostile, right? Uh, and as a Christian community, we're trying to spread the gospel within that empire. Now, can we get some hints about how they did that from reading the Acts of the Apostles? I'm, I'm hoping yes. I'm, I'm hoping yes. I, I don't absolutely know the answer to that question. I have some ideas, but I'd certainly like to hear some of yours as well. But to understand the Roman mind, Romans were very, very superstitious people. They conquered a lot of different nations. Okay, and there was a lot of different, uh, of course these different nations had different gods. Now, when I say that the Romans were superstitious, what I mean is that when they conquered a certain nation, they would allow that nation to worship, generally speaking, as it, has, as it had always worshipped. They would not force their Roman gods on, on the people, generally speaking. Okay, and the reason why they did that was because, well, what if these gods that they're worshipping are real? We don't want to make them angry, right? Um, and so let's just allow them to carry on as before, as long as it didn't get too crazy. Like things like human sacrifice and other things, the Roman Empire looked very down upon some of those things. Um, but their notion of piety, the, the Romans pretty much said, okay, we'll let you worship as you have before, just so long as you also worship some of our gods. 
or burn incense to the emperor, or light a candle to, you know, the god Jupiter, or whatever, okay? And most cultures were okay with that. Most cultures were okay with that. The one culture that was not okay with that was the Jews, because they were absolute monotheists. Now, and of course, the Christians took up this battle cry because we have the same faith when it comes to our monotheism. The Romans, the Romans considered themselves a very pious people, but their notion of piety is, was different than, I think, our notion of piety. Some, of, some things were similar, but some things very different. And what I'm trying to give you a background for is why this notion of conversion and repentance is so massive in the Acts of the Apostles and certainly goes throughout Jesus' life, okay? Imagine that your view of piety was this, that as long as you said a certain prayers or went up to a statue and burnt incense, um, lit a candle, maybe made a short pilgrimage to a certain shrine or to a certain temple, that's all you had to do to be okay with your gods. That was it. In other words, that did not, their, their notion of piety did not translate, generally speaking, into moral behavior. It was, it was mechanical. It was just about fulfilling certain external obligations. And then they were good. They were good with their gods. They could pretty much do as they pleased. The, the laws that they had that respected morality were really more for the protection of the family. Now, the Romans were very big on that. Um, it was really more about that than being pious because of their religions, because of their love of their gods. So imagine a group of Christians breaking in on this and saying, no, first of all, I'm absolutely not burning incense to Caesar Augustus. I will not do it. And you need to change your life, your whole life. You need to change your, your just your thinking. You need to change the way you feel. And that was the demand that the Christians were making in this Roman Empire. Now, that is the reason why the Christians, or one of the reasons, why the Christians got so much hostility from the Romans. They just refused to cooperate with this national understanding of religion. Like, I'm not going to your shrines. I'm not burning incense to your gods. I'm not doing it. Oh, and by the way, we really would like for you to change your behavior because it's somewhat offensive to God. Okay. Imagine, imagine telling that to your neighbors, right? Okay. But are we supposed to? Yeah. Yeah. In our own way, right? Sometimes very, very explicitly if we're called to do that. But apparently some of the Romans found this rather fascinating as well. It was very different. This was a new message. And not only the Christians, they were willing to be persecuted. They were willing to die, even. They were willing to be imprisoned. Because just, and this is what it makes me think of. And this is where, hopefully, we'll start making some spiritual applications. That, um, just imagine we had our version of, look, We'll let you worship, well, you Christians, we think you're crazy. Just do whatever you do, and we'll, we'll leave you alone. As long as you burn incense to this God, as long as you keep this belief, as long as you say that such and such a thing is okay, we'll leave you alone. What is our version of that? There's, there's lots there's lots of different beliefs. There, there's lots of ways that this culture is asking us to burn a little incense to the emperor, right? The early Christians 
refused to do it. One of the first crises, as a matter of fact, in the church was, and it was a massive crisis. As a matter of fact, I think that there were, I'd have to look at some of this history again. Um, you know, different popes were chosen because of their beliefs on this particular issue of whether or not it was okay to readmit Christians into the community who had burned incense to the emperor. That's how seriously they took it. It was a massive fight in the church that many priests and people said, look, you have, you have squashed the faith, you have turned your back on Jesus Christ, you cannot come back. Many of them actually believed that. Now, ultimately, it was decided that they couldn't reconcile, but they actually had to do years of public penance in order to return to the Christian community. So, I mean, this is a different understanding, but I'm just trying to give us a little bit of a snapshot uh, of the time and of the Roman understanding of, uh, of religion uh, and, and piety. Uh, and because that's what we're dealing with whenever the first Christians are entering into it and trying to transform it. Okay, does that make a little sense? That's so far? And I, I'm painting this with such massive broad strokes because there's, there's so much history involved in here um, that I, I, can't, I, can't, I can only scratch the surface. Um, another thing is that Greek philosophy and this had started several hundred years prior, but it, but Greek philosophy, which was the popular way of thinking, at least of the upper classes at the time, uh, had finally developed to a point where even uh, the rational mind, there were many men and women starting to think, you know, it makes sense to us, it's starting to make sense that maybe a lot of these pagan gods are just myths, and maybe all of this was just created by one single being, one all-supreme being. And there were a number of philosophers who were starting to figure this out rationally. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, our religion, our Christianity, was breaking in, uh, new minds that were starting to actually say, you know what? What, what are you preaching? One God? I said, yes. And we know that you don't know what his name is, but we do know what his name is. Let, let us introduce you to the God that you figured out with your head. Let us give you the rest of the story. The story of the heart and the story of how God actually wants to be united to his people. That's a story that they couldn't figure out. That's a story that had to be revealed to us through Scripture and through the apostles, right? So, so those were some ways that it seemed like the ancient world was, was ready. The fullness of time had come, was ready for the gospel to be spread. But it certainly wasn't easy. Lord, it wasn't easy. Now, from there, I'm going to start introducing... Acts itself. The author of Acts. Okay, do you know who wrote Acts? Luke, that is right. You sound very confident of that. You're just like, Luke, darn it. Okay. Um, yes, Luke. St. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Now, this is news to some people. Some people actually, they don't know this. Luke very intentionally um, intended the book of Acts to follow upon the gospel that he wrote. He, he, inten he intended that. In other words, when we look at the gospel of Luke, and if, you, and if you want to do some extra reading, as just a preliminary, reading the Gospel of Luke would certainly be a good idea. It, he didn't mean for 
the Gospel of Luke to be read over here and like Acts over here, as if it were two separate things. It's, it's, one, it's one complete story. Now, it certainly has two pretty significantly different parts, but what is happening in Acts is a logical, um, a logical connection or outcrop from what the Lord intends to happen in, in, um, in Luke, in the gospel itself. Uh, he wants a church founded. He wants the gospel spread. And so Luke is telling that story as well. I think it's, it's now was Luke an apostle? No. You, you need to. <laughs> you're, you're just, somebody else can answer some questions. No. No, she's apparently studied some of this. But is, is Luke an apostle? No. He is not an apostle. He is an evangelist. Again, for some people, that is news. Luke is not one of the twelve. Does that mean that we should consider him any less reliable? No. That's one of the four Gospels. Okay. Um, let's hear what, let's just hear what St. Luke says about himself. That's very interesting because um, we don't often hear this prologue uh, read in church. But if you just look at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, not Acts, but Luke. And he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for, for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Now, what, what Luke is saying is he's not an eyewitness. He's clearly telling us. I mean, I wonder if we've actually even gathered that, or if we've really ever read that. That he's, but he is telling us that, and we know this, because Luke is mentioned several times in Scripture. We know that he traveled with St. Paul, for example. Okay. Uh, we know that he, he literally lifts 300, I think it's 350 verses from the Gospel of Mark. Like almost word for word in Greek. So he's, he's aware of Mark. Now Mark is probably, and we're, we're fairly certain about this from early documents, probably the secretary of St. Peter. Whereas St. Luke was one of the secretaries of St. Paul. Isn't that fascinating? Um, but, and the, the way that, and these, some, some of these things are mentioned in Scripture. We can't cover all of them. Uh, I'll try to cover some of them as I go. But, I mean, just imagine you have someone like Luke. And also, according to some of the early fathers, second century, identify Luke. You know how uh, there's one point in Scripture where Jesus gathers together the 70 disciples and sends them out? Okay? That Luke, according to some traditions, was one of them. Okay, so here's a fellow who personally knew St. Paul. Okay, traveled with him. Probably, personally, I mean, lifted whole verses from St. Mark. We know Paul met Peter, so probably knows Peter firsthand as well. He's, he's friends with all of the, the apostles, with all of the, 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 the eyewitnesses. He's, he's in on the whole story, but apparently he is, he's a gifted writer. Now, we know from the style of his Greek, for example. Do you know how if you pick up, uh, pick up Shakespeare, and you pick up, whatever, a Danielle Steele novel or something, okay? The English is a little different, right? And you can tell 
okay, she might have some intelligence, okay? And, and this guy is certainly super, super intelligent because his English is obviously very good, okay? St. Luke's Greek is very good. So there's another tradition, though, that St. Luke, was, what was his occupation? He was a physician, he was a doctor. So that makes some sense. He's an educated man, but he's a, an intelligent educated man who tells a very good story. Luke is very well put together. Okay, now Matthew and Mark are a little clunky. Okay, it's like maybe possibly written or dictated by fishermen and tax collectors. And, uh, just possibly maybe. Okay, now John's Greek is very good as well. But, you know, and, and I, I'm throwing in some extra stuff, but do you remember in the Gospel of, like, why would John's Greek be so good? It might even be even better Greek than Luke's. Do we have any evidence about John's uh, social status in Scripture? Can you think of one single line? There is one line. That in the Passion, it mentions something like, and they let John in because he was known to the high priest. You remember that? Okay. He's like, why? Why, why was this simple dude known by the high priest? Apparently, there's, there's some sort of family connection John may have been very well educated for whatever reason, friends with their family, who knows. But there are little hints that we can pick up that match with what we see in Scripture. And it's, it's the job of a scripture, scripture scholar, which I am not. I'm an educated man, but I'm not a Scripture scholar. This, this stuff gets so much more layered and complicated than I can possibly explain. But I can at least throw all sorts of crazy stuff at you and see what sticks, right? I think it's fascinating. We're just trying to cover who is Luke? Not an eyewitness, but a very good writer and knows, probably met Jesus, probably saw a portion of his ministry uh, and obviously knows, like, what does Luke have that, that isn't really included in the other three Gospels, particularly speaking. Do you know what, what we find in Luke that's fairly unique or mostly well-known? Is a lot of the infancy stuff. Stuff about Mary, interestingly. Uh, and Luke very, concentrates very much... Luke mentions uh, a lot of the women in Jesus' life in a special way, which, which we'll, we'll probably cover. But he has some information, and see, imagine, imagine that you're Luke, and you have the Gospel of Mark. You've already read it, or at least an early draft of what is the Gospel of Mark. You know St. Peter, you know St. Paul, you possibly know some of the other individuals, okay? And you're looking at the Gospel of Mark, possibly even the Gospel of Matthew, um, and you're saying, you know what? But I, you know, Peter or John told me this whole other story that I don't, I don't see here. And so, if you were a faithful Christian who could write well, what would you do? You, hopefully, you would write an account of what you, you didn't see in the Gospel of Mark, for example. But you would include a lot of it because you want to be faithful to what he said as well. You, you see what I mean? Just, and what I'm trying to, uh, to give you a, at least a little bit of a picture of is, is how this likely came together. But you know, do we know this story for sure? No, we, no, we don't. I, I'm giving you a, a likely account that we have some academic evidence for but we don't know for absolutely certain, okay? I hope, I hope that that makes some sense. Now, the time of Acts, 
What is meant by the time? Well, as I mentioned, the time that we're reading is from pretty much Pentecost to, I think, St. Paul's one of his final imprisonments, um, which is somewhere, I have a timeline, but it's somewhere around 65 or so AD, uh, somewhere around there. So, so that's the time period of the book itself. But when was the book written? Well, that's, well, it had to have been written after that, but how might we have some evidence to know when Acts was written? Uh, just listen to this. Um, yeah, it was probably written somewhere around 63 AD, uh, soon after the account of St. Paul's imprisonment in the closing chapter. That's how it ends. Um, Keep in mind that this is a full generation after the death of Jesus and the Pentecost of the early church. Now we can infer from this uh, what Luke, sometimes it's more important what's left out than what's put in. And what is meant by that is that he makes no mention of the massive Roman fire the city of Rome almost burned to the ground uh, in, I think it was 64 AD. And he makes no mention of the massive Christian persecution that happens by uh, Nero in the year 70. No mention. You would, I mean, Luke is talking about the story of the early church at that time. Why would he leave that out? unless he was either himself killed, persecuted, or he just put the end uh, and he was never able to complete that story. So we can infer from sometimes what he doesn't say when it was probably written. I mean, it, I just, I th maybe I'm kind of a geek, but I find that fascinating, just the way that we can come up with Again, likely, that is a likely account. But here's the problem. Do we have a single original version of any book of the New Testament? Do you know whether, I mean, can you go to a museum and see St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, like the first draft? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. We have copies of copies. Uh, and and how scripture scholars have, have linked this together. I mean, imagine that you have the Gospel of Mark, and this is not hypothetical, this is real. And, and before you, you have 11 different copies written at different times, and it's mostly the same, but there are discrepancies. And using now, using modern science and all sorts of uh, or all sorts of different um, exegesis materials, we can figure out what the original probably said. Like, have you ever heard this argument, particularly from Protestants, that especially in the Middle Ages, the church frowned upon us reading scripture and told us not to do it? I mean, this that was an attitude that has lasted even, I mean, my parents talk about that. Um, we, we had a talk already. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is familiar to you? Have you heard this? Okay. But there, there is a reason for that. Um, the church was terrible, at least one of the reasons. There are several. Um, first of all, uh, what happens when you get a lot of very, very uneducated people who do not understand theology just deciding that they're going to interpret scripture. You, you, you can get a mess is, is what you get. But over and above that, there's lots of false copies of the Bible with bad information circulating. And that's even if you could find a copy. Finding a copy of a book in the Middle Ages was extremely difficult. But there was a lot of bad information and so the church was very strict 
about how what information got to the people because they wanted it to be the uh, as pure and as true to the original as it could be. Usually you don't hear that argument. But there, there are reasons why the church did some of those things. And was the church sometimes possibly overzealous about that? I'm sure it was at times. But there, there, were, there are reasons behind being careful about some of these translations. I hope, this, does that make a little sense? That's kind of a sidebar. And I, I'm going to stop and we're, we're going to take a little break um, right in a minute. How long have I been talking? Probably still too long. Okay. Um, the readership of Acts. The book of Acts is obviously written for Gentile, Gentile people or Gentile Christians, meaning non-Jews. It's pretty obvious. Now, why is it obvious? Again, we, you know, again, you have these literary hints. Imagine you you read a line that says something like. You know, Jesus went uh, to the Festival of Booths, uh, and then in parentheses it says, the Festival of Booths is this festival where the Jews did so and so and so, it's such a thing, okay? And he explains what the festival is. If he's explaining what Jewish festivals are, he's certainly not writing for Jews, because that would be insulting, right? Um, explaining to Jews what their own festivals mean. That's, that's just kind of gauche, you know. You know. Um, but we have hints about that. Uh, you know, who the, the book is being directed towards. Now, do you remember this, this little instance where uh, I read the prologue. It says, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. It's like, well, wait, hold on a second. Who's this Theophilus guy? Um, oh, do you know? I have a oh. question about that. Oh, okay. I'm but, wondering about the etymology of his name. That's, and that's, that's very good. Um, Theophilus. Um, I mean, in Greek, um, it's a combination of theos and, uh, and philia, literally meaning friend of God. So, what might that mean? It could mean, it could mean several things. And the short answer is we do not know for sure who the Theophilus <laughs> works, okay? Um, so let me talk for 10 minutes about stuff that we don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, there's two possibilities. It was very common in the ancient world uh, to dedicate a particular work to a wealthy patron. It was extremely important to have wealthy patrons, like for writers and artists. Why? Because writing a book and getting it copied was an expensive, expensive endeavor. Uh, so, I mean, a patron, in other words, if you're a great philosopher, he said, okay, I'll, I'll provide materials for this book, uh, and I'll... I'll hire 50 other scribes to copy it when you're finished. It was a pretty common, a common thing to do. So Theophilus, which was a Greek name, it was a real Greek name, uh, could be a real person, a real patron, who, who agreed to have, have this copy. Okay. But here's an, here's an interesting thing about how scripture comes to us and how there can be mistakes. I, I actually did this. I saw it I, because I lived in a monastery. How do we get a lot of these copies? Because monks made copies of all of these books, right? Hopefully y'all know that. Um, that we did an experiment one time and our novice master had uh, the five of us, my novice class, copy 
uh, it was about half of the Gospel of Mark. Okay, he just said, just write it, just write it down. I, I felt like I was I'm like, is this punish work? What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Okay, and then after that, he said, okay, let's let's take a look at what you copied. And it was amazing how many mistakes we made. And, and, and how many, and the difference, like we, you know, we got tired and we skipped a whole verse. Okay, just like, yeah, okay, verse three, gone. Um, uh, but, but that's what has happened to some of our copies. It's like, wait a minute, this, this copy has this verse and this copy doesn't, and in this one and the words are changed. And, but I saw that happen. I actually did it, uh, and it was very, very informative, um, and, and scripture scholars, one of their main jobs is not just interpreting scripture, but making sure that what we have is, is translated well, and that we have, we have the word in as pristine a form as we can. Um, it's an incredibly important job for those of them that are, that are faithful to it. Uh, the purpose of Acts, as Acts records the highlights of the first 30 years of Christian history, I've mentioned this before, um, I, I want us to take a look at, for the purpose, if you take a look at the Gospel of Luke, remember of course Luke wrote Acts, um, the last chapter, 24, starting with verse 44, Usually the, the last words of a great man is, are is something that we generally should pay attention to, right? You know, if a great man says a few words and dies, leaves, you know, that's often something that we take note of and we should. Well, these are some of the last words of the Son of God. So they're pretty important, right? So then he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried to heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing them. Now, as, as beautiful as that is, I mean, we, we take a look at how Acts begins, and it just picks, it picks up right, pretty much right where it left off. There's another dedication to Theophilus, if we take a look at it. Um, and he reminds us that Jesus says, look, you shall be my witnesses, and, and, and instructs them to wait for the Holy Spirit. They, they really, they aren't entirely sure what they're waiting for. The, the Lord has given them some hints, but who could possibly anticipate the Holy Spirit, you know? Um, that must have been the greatest surprise ever, right? <laughs> A good one, okay. But... I find this fascinating when we look at what Jesus tells them to do. What do we need to do? We need to be his witnesses, and then repentance and forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations. That's, that's the directive. That's like, if we, wanna, if we wanna boil down the Lord's last words, he's like, look, you're my witnesses. You're my representatives. You've seen some of these things. You've felt some of these things. I want two things preached to every creature under heaven. Forgiveness of sins and repentance. 
Now, when we look at St. Peter's first speech on Pentecost, what does he focus on? Repentance, forgiveness of sins. I mean, and, and just, just when you read it, just try to remember that, that there's a unity here. Peter is listening absolutely to what the Lord has, has told him. He's fulfilling the directive given to him uh, by his Lord and Savior. And all of this is done in the Spirit. The Spirit plays a massive role in the Acts of the Apostles. Why is that the case? Um, and that's a huge question too. But we need to understand that, like Jesus, if you just look at Jesus' ministry, just his life and his death, he never, he never leaves Palestine. And in a certain sense, we, we could almost, and, and I, I'm not saying this, but I've seen certain scripture scholars and they're trying to make a point that in a certain sense, his mission or his preaching mission is a failure. He just preaches to this fairly tiny, this, this tiny section of the world. I mean, he's the son of God. He has a gospel for the whole planet. So what's going on there? Well, he also directly told his apostles, you will do greater things than these. Spirit. And the, the conversion of the rest of the world, which is the story begun in Acts, is done by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers them and enables them to do things and to say things that they were not able to do on their own. And we, we see this on every page of Acts. That's why I called it like new life in the Spirit. I, I actually had a few people say, well, I don't know if I want to come because I, I, I think it's a charismatic prayer meeting. And I'm like, what? What? Like, and then I remembered that I think that there used to be a charismatic movement or something called life. But why should we be afraid of that title? I mean, fine. Look, if we all start speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit descends upon us, that's, let, that's up to the Lord, right? I'm, I'm not going to tell you to do that, though, because it's not up to me. That's up to him. Uh, but the Acts of the Apostles is the story of what the Holy Spirit can do in the world with his church if, if we allow him. And that's something that I think that we need to understand just as we begin. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to just take a, a short break. Um, and I'm going to make a, a, another short presentation. Every class will not look like this. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that to you, though, before you leave. But I'm just going to, uh, to speak a little bit of just about the, the nature of reading Scripture. Um, well... And, and just a few housekeeping things about uh, how the class uh, how the class will go and, and other things that I, I, we can bend and move if, if certain other formats might work better and we can talk about that. But hopefully you understand what I'm trying to do is we're, we're about to enter into kind of a dark archway called the Acts of the Apostles. Okay. For some of us, it's a lot darker than others, okay? If you've walked in there before, if you're accustomed to studying scripture, you know how that's done. You have some context for it. I know for a fact that some of you have no context for it. So, so what I'm trying to do is, is uh, make that archway, I guess, a little brighter so that you're not entering into it going, well, what is going on? God bless you. That was another one. Again, and that was official. Um, and free of charge. Okay. Um, but that's, that's what I'm trying to do with just some of these preliminary comments. Uh, that you have some understanding of what we're talking about with the time, the author, the place, um, the audience. 
uh, what some of the Romans, uh, what you know, what some of them were thinking at the time. Why this whole notion of conversion and repentance and forgiveness of sins was so important. It's because it was not important at all to the Roman world. And the Lord apparently wanted, well, not just the Roman world, to the world, but the Lord want, wanted to bring those notions to the world. So, and there's so much uh, other things that could be said about, about Acts, but uh, I think that that at least gives you a, a snapshot, uh, a little bit of a painting of, of what we're entering. And I think it's just, it's fascinating, just speaking personally, um, I was praying about this because I was open to doing, I was open to doing a number of different things. Um, like I, I, one of my Greek projects was to translate John, for example. Um, I was thinking very much about doing that. But uh, as I prayed more and more about it, um, I, I just, I see a lot of similarities between, I think, the Christian community then and the Christian community now. Um, there's, there's a lot of hostility between the world and between the Christian community. The Christian community has, has grown smaller. Um, but I think, um, as Pope Benedict often said, more, more serious, maybe, more faithful, um, which, is, which is something that we need to be. But I think that we see in the Acts of the Apostles uh, a blueprint of what the Lord wants to happen, uh, what, it, what it could look like, again, how it probably does look in certain sections of the world. Uh, I, I think that it f just forces us to take a look at how we live our lives as, as a community and as individuals and compare it to how they lived their life, and then to ask ourselves, well, what, what needs to change? Because that's, that's what conversion and repentance means. It means change, but of course not only any change, but a, a change of the heart and the mind to God and to, to His will. Um, so I, I, just, I think there's a lot of gems in there for us. Um, that I that I don't I mean I have some idea about a, a few of them that I've found because I've read it and, and prepared some of it, but that's where sharing some of this with each other uh, is going to be I think extremely helpful uh, because in in studying scripture we can't possibly exhaust the meaning of the Word of God. You. And that I can't just give you the interpretation of a certain passage. Now, the church certainly has particular, very important interpretations of particular passages. Absolutely. Things that should hold pride of place. Whenever we take a look at certain passages, we, we have a church, thank God, namely the Catholic Church, that gives us some direction on what these things do mean. But that doesn't mean that it only means that. That sometimes I can read these passages and they mean certain things personally to me. Or they mean something in a particular time, in a particular place, to a particular group of people. And that could be us. And, you know, what might we share with each other about what we're finding that could inspire you know, all of us collectively, right? That's that's what it's all about. Like a gift of prophecy, for example, which is certainly, thank God, not exclusive to the priesthood, um, that you might have a, a word, a word from the Lord about, you know, I, I really think that the Lord wants me to say this about this particular passage. Like, that's... That's part of the gift of prophecy. You're, you're speaking out the word of God in a particular way, in a particular time, in a particular place. Um, and that, that could come to any of us. Um, 
the gift that I'm using or the gift that I'm hoping that I'm using is teaching, uh, which, which is a gift to, to organize a body of material and try to make it understandable to a certain level to, to the people that he has in front of him. Okay, that's, that's a little different than hearing something more directly from God and being stirred and saying, and this has happened, this will happen in the course of sometimes my teaching that I feel like I really need to stop and, and tell you something that I didn't plan. Okay, I, you, those of you that have given presentations and the, those of you that are teachers, I'm sure that you've experienced something like that. And that's when teaching and, and, and preaching and prophecy, they sort of, they, they mix together. Um, and this nice uh, gumbo, as we'd say, down south. <laughs> but, um, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just, again, trying to, uh, to make this uh, a little brighter, this archway, this dark, possibly dark archway, a little brighter for you. Um, but a few things about sacred reading. Um, you, those of you that were in Hearts Transform, uh, I believe that Father Jack did give a presentation on, a, we call it Lexio Divina, is, is the name in Latin, which simply means divine reading or uh, sometimes holy reading. It can be translated in a few different ways. And I want to just remind us, give a quick snapshot of this, um, because we're, we're reading scripture. We're not reading a novel, nor are we really just reading for information. Okay, that's, that's key to understanding uh, holy reading, what holy reading is all about, or what Lexio Divina is all about. Um, it's like, are we reading to gain some new knowledge and new information? Of course, but it should be more than that. It, it should really be, it should be a prayer that this is not just academic, it's, um, it's something truly spiritual. Do you know the, I know I've mentioned this before, but I like to, I like to say it again. The, the story, or I believe it's a parable, Jesus may have uh, actually seen this one. Um, it's the, the, the publican and the um, I guess it's the Pharisee or the, the tax collector and the Pharisee, and both of them are praying in the temple. Yeah. And the Pharisee, I believe it's Pharisee, could be a scribe, I can't remember. But he's like, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not grasping. And, you know, just like those terrible people, like this awful tax collector who's in here. I mean, you remember this parable? And the tax collector uh, says he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven. Uh, and just, I think, says, um, what, have mercy on me, uh, sinner, right? Um, there's a few key words in there in Greek that are translated in, in good translations about what the Pharisee says whenever he prays. It specifically in Greek says, and he took up his position in the temple and said to himself, Oh Lord, what's wrong with that statement? I mean, really, the, the, there's a secret interpretation to that parable. It's not just about one of them's humble and one of them's prideful. That's the usual business that you get from the pulpit whenever that Sunday comes up. And it's fine, it's true. I don't, I don't want to be snotty, okay? But the, the other layer to that is that he's not even praying. He's talking to himself. Yeah, in a way, he really is. He's, he's justifying himself. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that when we're doing this, let's not talk to ourselves. That's, that's not what we're doing. We, we want to we wanna try to engage in, in a conversation with the Lord, right? So that we're not talking to ourselves. I, I remember having kind of a, a repentance moment. And repentance moments can be kind of uh, difficult. 
for those of you that have had them, you know what I mean. But I really had a realization one day, um, and, and it was whenever I discovered this, this thing about that passage. Like, you know what, I think that a lot of my prayer I've been talking to myself. Um, and I know that didn't feel very good. But, um, but the Lord in his mercy wanted to, he wants to correct me. He wants to say, look, let, maybe you'll do a little bit better if you talk to me a little bit more, okay? Uh, let's change this up a bit, okay? So that's, the, that's our goal. And there are several steps to, to Lexio. Now, uh, this is a very traditional way that, that monastic reading has taken place. And I, as most of you know, I was in a monastery for 14 years, and we did this every day, sometimes twice a day. Uh, and whenever I had my novitiate classes, this is what I was taught. This is the, the ancient way of doing holy reading. So I'm, I'm not giving you something new or something innovative. I'm, I'm giving you a tradition that has been practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, in the monasteries. The first step, lexio, that just means reading. The reading itself. You got to start with. You got to start with the word. Okay. Um, the biggest thing to remember about that is that the ancient way of reading, if we want to do these things like the ancient Christians, right? We're studying the Acts of the Apostles. They read out loud. They read out loud and often standing up. But um, one of the, well, there's several reasons for that. A lot of times the books were so heavy that they had to put them on a stand. And they're... You're right, but sometimes we forget about stuff like that. Um, they they could they this that it didn't exist. There was no such thing as a document like that. Um, but they read it out loud. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I need to check this again. But it was I want to say it was Ambrose that there are several um, letters and accounts of people being shocked and even scandalized and bothered that St. Ambrose read quietly to himself without speaking out loud. Like, as if he was doing something new just by sitting with a book and reading it in our head like, like the way that most of us read, right? Um, and that was around or maybe 300 or so AD. Um, but when we read out loud, we engage in more senses, right? We can hear the word. We can, we can feel the word. Like there's, it engages more of our person. And, and sometimes something happens whenever we read out loud. Um, we can skip over things in our minds. I mean, my minds are... My mind can be so scatterbrained. Y'all, I just today, today I walked up to the door of the rectory and I pressed my car open button. I pressed it a couple of times. Okay, I was thinking about my lecture and other things and I stopped and I went, like, oh, seriously, Basil? I mean, it's like open. Um, but we, we, we skip things. We, we miss things. And the Word of God shouldn't be missed. It shouldn't be skipped. And especially if you're reading, okay, if you don't read the whole thing out loud, which I honestly would recommend, I mean, with this class, or with whatever you want to call it, um, just study, why, why not do a few things differently? I mean, that's, that's what it's for. You know, try, try some, and why not try what our ancient brothers and sisters tried for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know. So, I, you know, I'm not telling you to try something, oh, this modern psychologist said that this was a good idea. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is how it was done. Um, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it, would, maybe it would do something different for us. Maybe it would sink in a little bit more. Um, I have found that that's true, especially whenever I'm reading a passage and, and, it, and it strikes me in a, in a special way. 
And that's another thing about Lexio that, you know, when you're reading, um, it's, you're not reading for information. So do not put yourself under pressure to just finish. Um, you, would, you would think, this, it's like, oh, I have, to, I have to finish chapter one. Well, what happens if the Holy Spirit talks to you on the third verse? My suggestion is that you be quiet <laughs> and stop and ask the Holy Spirit what he's trying to say, you know. It, like, don't put yourself under pressure to complete this as if it were some sort of task. If it's a prayer, then we, sh if you really feel like something is affecting you, for whatever reason, then stop and attend to it, okay? Attend to that. This is really where we get into um, meditatio. So that's the reading itself. We do it slowly. We do it prayerfully. Um, possibly out loud. Uh, the way that it has been done in the past. And not necessarily for information. But meditatio, which of course is the Latin word for... Meditation. Shocking, right? Um... That, that is where we, we really stop and, and study is appropriate. You know, first we read, we read prayerfully, but it is appropriate to, to maybe look at a commentary or pick up your dictionary because you don't understand what that vocabulary word means. Uh, or, or take a look at some of the footnotes that some of your Bibles may have and see what they have to say about it. That's fine. Um, their meditatio in Latin actually, um, well, it means in the middle, but it, it was used in different ways in Latin. Uh, it almost has the con connotation of chewing on something. Like that's, that's the, um, and, and we still have that expression when, when, when we're thinking about something. Sometimes I've heard people say that, you know, I'm still chewing on it. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm breaking it down. Breaking it down so that it can become part of me. Perfect analogy. In, in monastic literature, uh, this process, the, the main analogy that was used was eating. There, there's a reason. That's not my analogy. That's an ancient analogy that I am stealing. Uh, because, again, learn, I don't want to tell you new innovative stuff. I want to tell you the best stuff that has been written or said about it um, to try to be faithful to what has been handed down, okay? So meditatio has this connotation of, of chewing, that it's okay to think. Like, just because I told you before, well, Father Basil said not to think to my, no, I, did, I didn't say <laughs> not to think for yourself or to yourself. Just don't stop there. That's, that's a better way of saying it. The Lord gave us our minds to use. So it's perfectly fine to use them. Just don't quit there. Okay. Um, hopefully that, uh, that makes some sense. Oratio. And this is, this is where it really gets more into prayer. Okay. Oratio is the root of an, an oration uh, or, or a prayer. Um, that's, that's the Latin word for prayer, oratio. Okay. In other words, when we're reading and we chew on it, hopefully this brings us to some kind of response. Um, that's when the you journalers, okay, you start picking up your journal and be like, oh, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm thinking. Like, you're starting the oratio process whenever you pick up that journal. Or when you just start praising God. Or when you start asking Him for things. Even possibly singing. Okay. Now some people I know, they'll read scripture, they'll just, they'll break into song. That's great. I would suggest not bothering other people too much with that, unless you have a really good voice. But um, <laughs> if, if God asks you to sing, sing. Okay. Uh, by all means. But you respond in some way. 
We talk, or just talk to God. Talk to the Lord. I mean, we can address our prayer to several different people. Ask for the intercessions of Peter and Paul. Talk to the Blessed Mother. Talk to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I mean, there, there are certain relationships that different ones of us feel more comfortable with when we're relating to God or to the saints. And it's perfectly acceptable. Um, so, so that should lead us to some kind of response. Um, in the very least, some uh, listening, even just stopping and listening is a form of prayer. Just be quiet. We, we don't do that enough. I, I'm very convinced that a, a lot of these things, which of course I carry, uh, a lot of the noise in this world is orchestrated by the evil one to drown out silence. Absolutely. I absolutely believe that. Because it's usually in the silence whenever we truly confront ourselves and God. Now, the year that I spent at the monastery, cloistered, we weren't allowed, actually I didn't leave the grounds for about a year and a half. That was one of the hardest year and a half of my life. Um, you would think, oh, what a, it's a big vacation. You got to pray and study all the time. But some of it was great, but you really have to, you really have to confront some things that are not very easy to confront. Uh, and there weren't very many distractions. We couldn't have any computers or, or anything like that. It was very uh, strict, at least in the early, the earlier years. Um, not so much in the later years. That's why I'm here, right, right in there. Um, that's another story. So hopefully you you understand that about oratio. It should be a springboard into some form some form of prayer. With, and there are a number of them. Hopefully related to what you've read, but God can take you on a number of different avenues, right? Uh, and then finally, contemplatio. Uh, one of the translations for that word, uh, which is the root word for contemplation. You know, again, another one of those crazy, difficult Latin words to understand. Yeah. <laughs> Just add it in. Um, in Latin, one of the translations is, uh, is in the temple. Um, if you can imagine, well, let me just ask you a question. Do you think that you can contemplate whenever you want? Can you contemplate at will? If I just tell you, in, in, in the sense that it's meant here, that's probably a trick question. In the sense that it's meant here, no, we can't. What I mean is this. A lot of people confuse meditation and contemplation. And the word meditation, especially now that we have a lot of New Age stuff going on, and that it's a very charged word. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, the, the original sense in Latin is you're chewing on the meaning of something prayerfully. That's the meaning of meditatio, and that's, and that's it. That's, that's essentially the meaning. Contemplation is whenever you, some, the Lord has invited you into his presence. Now, his presence is always with us. But sometimes we know it. Sometimes we feel it. Um, if you can imagine, you know, the Lord uh, sits in his throne room. But that throne room is locked from the inside. And he opens it when he feels like it. But by this process, we knock on the door. We knock, we knock, we pray. We, we, and sometimes it opens, and sometimes it, it seems closed. For, for reasons that I can't explain to you. There, there's a lot of reasons why um, the Lord might open or close. But what a wonderful thing. And I've gotten these questions, and I'm not trying to treat you like children. These are questions that I've actually gotten. Like, well, Father Basil, I was reading, uh, and I, I just got on like the second verse, and I, I just felt like God's presence was right there. But, but I remembered that I, I skipped 
uh, the step two and step three, and I didn't meditate, and I really didn't do a prayer because I was doing it wrong. I'm like, oh boy, um, no, don't do that, okay? The point, the whole point, is, is to get to contemplation. Uh, if you can get there, if you're invited there. But we can, we can make it easier for the Lord to invite us there, or we can make it harder for Him, right? Because grace builds on nature. If, if, we're, if we pray, in other words, if we, if we pray, if we're silent, if we're reading His Word, He uses our humanity, and that makes it easier for Him to actually show up and reveal Himself to us. But if we're loud and we don't pick up scripture, we, we tend to be selfish and, and distract ourselves, it makes it harder for him. Uh, he can do what he wants, but he works with our will. He wants us to cooperate with him. And this is a process by which we can cooperate with him using his word to get into that temple. Because that's because that's the whole point, to really be with him. So, I mean, I have, so by all means, if you start praying and you feel that God's presence is resting upon you, mission accomplished, right? This is, this is part of my problem with even some, like the saying the rosary, for example. Um, I mean, my background uh, I had some Irish friends. They are the fastest rosary uh, prayers uh, ever. They they can win some speed contests. The Italians are pretty close behind. Uh, I have a, a, a large part of the family is Italian. But you would think that the whole point was just to finish. But I don't, if the Blessed Mother, if, if the Blessed Mother actually starts talking to you or inspiring you in some way and you're on deck at number two, stop and and discuss whatever she wants to discuss with you. I mean, um, if you only have 20 minutes and you get to deck at number three, don't, you know, don't fret about it. The whole, what, what would her whole point be? A, to talk to her, or even more so, to introduce you to her son. That's, that's what she's always doing. Um, that's just a little bit of a pet peeve, but it has absolutely nothing with what, to do with what we're talking about. I just wanted to introduce you some to, just to the fact that even the reading process, um, consistent with what I've tried to present already, uh, we're going into we're going into this uh, adventure, hopefully, of of reading scripture, um, spent, you know, the Acts of the Apostles particularly, and I don't and I, I don't want that process to be dark, you know. I, I want to at least introduce you to some background and some how to, uh, so that you just have a little to go on, um, and and the Lord will do the rest, um, just cooperate with him. So, so there's just a few things about uh, sacred reading. Uh, just finally, with uh, housekeeping, I do have some handouts for you. If I could get a couple people to, to help me with this, I wanna, I'll pass these out, maybe. I think I have, yeah, I should have. Um, Now, this is what uh, I had imagined. In this class, of course, we're not actually into the text itself, but by the next one, uh, I have some assignments that I've already written. Like, I, I do have some notes about what I just said on there. The, those are actually class notes for the first class, which is this one, and the second one, which is, of course, uh, the subsequent one. Now, what I was imagining us doing is this. I have not, we're going to be doing this fairly slowly, roughly two chapters per class, okay? So that's pretty slow. Uh, I haven't given you, 
some sort of day-by-day -day reading schedule. That's really, that's not much material. But what I have done is, um, after praying about this, given you maybe four to six sessions. And it's up to you when you're going to sit down and do those sessions. Okay? That, that if you just, uh, a few times a week, uh, dedicate yourself to like, okay, I'm, I'm going to read scripture uh, these three days. And, and I have given you, uh, you know, outlined a certain reading program. Uh, and even given you maybe some other verses to read that are related to that particular section of Acts. And even some questions. Uh, some of you are okay with coming up with your own inspirations of reading scripture. But some of you, I've found, uh, really benefit from being asked a few guide questions. Uh, and so I've, so I've provided a, a few of those. So I haven't structured things rigidly, but I've given you some structure. Um, and it's up to you when you want to fit those sessions in. And you can, you can repeat them. You know, there, we could do this in a number of ways. Um, does, that, does that make some sense? Okay. Um, and before, I, before I go on, uh, so we'll read that, and then I'll, uh, I'll have a lecture on it. And, and this is how I, what I imagine that this will go. Uh, and I'm open to changing this. Now, the first part will be a lecture, but, uh, and I imagine a, a, part, a second part of being more like questions or discussion, okay, where, where all of us could, can share something about the reading or inspirations in some way, shape, or form, okay. I know that with Hearts Transform, we broke into small groups. Um, I, I've, I've been trying to take, uh, I guess, take a poll in a way about breaking into small groups. It seems to be that most people would rather not do that. Um, the problem, and this is a good problem to have, this is a large group, but it makes discussion a little harder. I mean, if we were only 15 or so, then, you know, maybe we could circle up and, um, and you know, talk back and forth, but that this group makes that a little harder. Uh, so, so with the next class, I was thinking that uh, we would just stay in a single group and try it, and just try discussing things amongst ourselves or questions back and forth. But I don't know, what, what do you, th this is your class too, so if everybody's gung-ho for small groups, we can, we can arrange that. Um, and I also provide in, in the homework um, maybe some keywords like uh, especially the, this whole notion of the kingdom of God, uh, just the, the Pentecost uh, and the meaning of witness, uh, those are key words that you have to understand in order to understand that, that reading. Uh, so hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm giving you, still giving you something to go on so that you have a few hints about how to proceed. Um, so I was just imagining giving a, a giving a presentation and opening it for discussion. Um, so, uh, with that being said, I uh, does anybody have any questions or in, on anything that I've shared or, or comments, amendments, insults, um, corrections? Sometimes, <laughs> and I mean, any, it could be anything. Um, so it is yeah, eight thirty. That's not too bad. No. I think we're right with you. What's that? I think we're right with you. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully uh, that made a minimal amount of uh, amount of sense. And and as we progress, um, I do want you to keep in mind though. As you read, um, what are the similarities between now and then, and and well, how would you react? Again, like almost place yourself in the scene 
Um, like say you're at Pentecost, you know, how would you have reacted to what must that have felt like? Um, and ask God about those things. Um, oh, and one other thing about Alexia, always begin in invoking um, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, you know, as a prayer. You don't, because we can be influenced by not just the Holy Spirit. Right? There are other spirits. There's our spirit that's attached to certain things, and there's also the spirit of the world, just propaganda that we hear, and there's also an evil spirit that tries to trick us into thinking and doing and feeling things that are contrary to God's will. So, <clears throat> so we always ask for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, before we read. So with that in mind, let's, uh, let us invoke the Holy Spirit um, uh, as we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we ask you to, uh, to continue to send our, your Spirit to us. Uh, the Spirit that we received in our baptism and our confirmation uh, in a special and powerful way. Rekindle that Spirit within our hearts uh, so that we, may, we might truly be your witnesses boldly uh, throughout the world. And let us ask the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, our death. Amen. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You're completely. Uh, I didn't mention yes this yesterday to the to the morning group, but for those of you that that really enjoy the small group experience, uh, please organize one. I I, I can't uh, do all of that because I'm, I'm kind of busy sometimes. But if you have even one, two, three other people that may be in the off week, y'all want to just sit down and start talking about some of the things that you're reading, please do. That's That would be a, a wonderful idea. Um, uh, so, you know, exchange some phone numbers or emails, and, and please, please do that. Um, so, okay, thank you.